As we get started this morning, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my personal story, specifically my marriage to my wife. My wife and I got married 17 years ago. Some of you were actually there. It was a great ceremony right here in the Savannah area. Wonderful wedding, such tremendous just blessing. Those beautiful dress as she walked down the aisle and caught me captive. Man, what an amazing day. And then we stood face to face, as some of you have done who are married, and we exchanged vows. We exchanged a covenant. We said, hey, I'm going to do this forever. Ever. And this is what it looks like for us. Then after our marriage, we jumped onto a plane, which by the way, we missed the first flight of our honeymoon. I don't know how that happened. We missed the flight to our honeymoon where we were headed off to St. Lucia. We were going to spend some time, one, a week or so in one of those environments. They're all inclusive. Man, those things are amazing. Now, I want you to imagine just for a moment, as if we went on our honeymoon, and while we're meant to enjoy this time to come together as husband and wife, imagine that on one of the days, I like to go scuba diving. My wife is not into scuba, and so I go off and go scuba diving, but well, something tragic happens. Imagine if while I'm off in scuba, my wife decides to go down to the hotel bar, meets this cute guy at the bar. Imagine if on my honeymoon that my wife had went into the marriage bed of another man. That is exactly what happened in the book of Exodus. You know my wife well enough to know, and she's now in the room, so she's probably going to shoot me for this one afterwards. <laughs> but imagine what happened in the book of Exodus. And here's the story that I want to show you. <coughs> Excuse me. That we are called through scripture, through the story of Exodus, particularly in Exodus chapter 32, to forsake all others and to embrace wholehearted devotion. Over the next few minutes, I want to kind of present to you Exodus chapter 32, but I want to view it through the lens of a love story. I'd like to show you this for just a moment as we look at this, how God, creator of the universe, identifies a group of people, a nation called Israel, and assigns to them this identity. You are a chosen people. I have chosen you to be mine. You're my treasured possession. There are chosen people. Out of all people, I choose you. How good does it feel to be chosen? Have you ever been chosen for something? Like, I don't know, maybe at work or on a team. Chosen for something, it was a special role or some kind of special project. Have you ever been chosen for something? Maybe some of you in this room were even chosen to be adopted chosen. Somebody would love you enough to choose you and bring you into family. Have you ever been chosen? Well, if you're married, you were chosen. I chose my wife. You chose your spouse. How good does it feel to actually be chosen? And then let's take it a step further. How good would it feel for Israel to be chosen by God? How good is it for you? to be chosen by God. I want you to view this lens or this story through the lens of a love story as God begins to choose his group of people. And then we see something as he chooses his people and declares his affection, something's revealed about the very nature and character of God. And at face value, it might produce tension or question or lack of understanding. There's something that's revealed is that God himself by character, by nature, even says his name itself encompasses, envelops this concept of our God is a jealous God. Inside of a loving relationship, there's a jealous God who says that you shall have, and what's the word? Come on, help me out. And you shall have no other God for the Lord your God, whose name is, and what's his name? Jealous, because he is a jealous God. 
So inside of this idea here, we have this jealous God. And so that you understand that this is not envy. This isn't some like human emotion that we experience out of a sense of insecurity. No, it's not that at all, that we have a jealous God and jealous God who desires my whole heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, becomes the defining characteristic of what it means to enter into a loving relationship with a heavenly father. And so they're in this covenant relationship and begins to declare and decide, you're mine, you belong to me. It becomes a part of their identity. Just as if when my wife changed her name to mine, when two became one, when we were brought together, they're entering into a covenant relationship. You belong to me and I will be your God. You'll be my people and I will be yours. It's this relationship. It's based on, it's based on love. It's based on a trust for one another. And it's based on a call to faithfulness that goes both ways both God and Israel enter into this loving relationship and here's the agreement here's what we saw here's what we came to just last week as we looked at this story that there would be a call to forsake all others in the same way that we enter into a marriage covenant, it becomes a picture of this love story this relationship and it has rules for relationship this seems fair doesn't it if somehow I had stood eye to eye with my wife and we were exchanging vows and I somehow thought that it was a good idea to say, well, we could be polygamist. We could somehow have a whole bunch of others in our life to divide our hearts and our devotion. Now, I don't know if you know my wife. She ain't having none of that. I don't know if you know me, but I wouldn't have any of that. What about you in your marriage? In your relationship. Doesn't it seem like as God sets up this rule for relationship and he begins to say, hey, this calling, this love that we have for each other, it requires something that we would actually forsake all others and only devote ourselves to each other. You shall have no other gods before me. And here's, even though they agreed it, even though they were very quick to say, yes, God, I love you. I'm for you. Let's be in relationship. Even though they profess their love and make their declarations, even though they exchange vows, they find themselves in a predicament facing a problem. See, as we pick up in Exodus chapter 32, this is the famous scene where Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments from God. Moses is away meeting with God, the creator, and God's going to give them a word specific for their life, their direction about his affection for them and the rules for relationship. While Moses is away, something happens. Watch this in 32 one. When the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and they said to him, I want you to consider this for a moment. The people, Israel, they would look out and they would see. And this becomes the challenge because they were accustomed to visual representation of God. God's power had been on display visually. They could literally see as God would part the Red Sea waters parted. They could literally see God's power through the plagues being demonstrated. They could literally see as God would lead them and guide them. And in addition to God's leadership in their life, they also had something in between God and themselves. They had another voice. They had Moses as the mediator, this communicator between God and his heart and the heart of humanity. And so here's something that happens in this moment when they're accustomed to seeing God a certain way. There's this tension that begins to grow up within them. And if I boiled it down to a question, here's the question that brings the tension is where's God gone? I saw him act this way. He used to do that. I saw him moving this way. But now in this moment, something's going to happen. 
I used to see the presence of God leading and guiding us, but now there's this temporary situation in which the presence of God is missing and they're tempted to lean into places of comfort and control, to chase after, to produce within themselves a place of security and a place where they can hold on to their beliefs. There's this question that rolls within them is where's God gone? And when this question rolls, when it lodges in the heart, Maybe it's been in your heart before too. Maybe it's in your heart now. Where's God gone? I used to know him as, but now I'm not so sure. Something happens within the heart of the Israelites and their response is to begin to move into search of something. They're in search of security and satisfaction. They're looking for God to move in a certain way. They have an expectation of his timeline. God and Moses, it wasn't that long that they were away. But when God seemingly went silent, something happened on the inside of them. They go in search of security and satisfaction. Fear begins to set in and begins to control their faith. Exodus 32 goes on to begin to say it this way in 32 and 1. The people saw and so they gathered to themselves. And then he goes on. Watch what they say when they gather together, when they get other like-minded individuals and says, hey, we got to come up with a solution. We need to do something about this. God is not who he says he is. We need to do something. In 32, 1 and B, it says it. Make us gods who shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened. We don't know where they went. We don't know how this is supposed to go. And, and something is happening in the middle of this that we see that this delay ends up leading them to this place of making these demands. They're going to gather together. There's something in their heart and it's not the way that they want it to be. And so here's my list of demands and here's the way it needs to go. So it's, it's, a, it's a transition. It's a transition of trust. God is the one who has gone before us. He's supposed to lead us. He's supposed to guide us. And now we need, we need to put someone, something else in God's place. We need to assume control. God's not doing it my way. It's not in my time, not in the way that I thought it was going to be. I need to assume control, which basically means that I need to become my own God to create other false gods to produce this thing that's unchecked within me. It's a desire. Something happens within them as they begin to assume control and make demands of even the leaders and the voices around them. It's a transition of trust and Here's what we see is the people gather together and they're going to go and talk to Aaron, Aaron, brother of Moses. Like if anybody was going to know to do differently, it would be this dude, brother of Moses. Like God actually spoke through you. Yeah, I know it was Moses who was the mediator, but Aaron, you understood Aaron the people begin to gather together and they begin to speak to him and they say this in 32 and two. And so Aaron says to all of the people, he doesn't redirect them. He doesn't point them towards God. He just says, hey, here's what we can do together. And he begins to tell them, take these physical objects that you have, like the gold earrings, both men and women, the jewelry that you have, and let's gather it together. And so Moses says, take off the rings of gold. And then he begins to do something. In verse four here, he's going to receive the gold. He's going to fashion it into a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. <laughs> As I was studying for this and I was planning this sermon and I started to call the sermon golden calves, but here's why I didn't. It was forever embedded in my mind and I couldn't preach a sermon with this in there. You're welcome. You can't get rid of this either. <laughs> so something happens. Aaron begins to gather this gold from the people and he fosters this thing. He creates this golden calf type image. And the question it really becomes, how could they? 
how could you replace God with this? How could they? And how do you do it so soon while still on your honeymoon? How does this happen? How do they reduce God to less? How do they make God, and watch this, they somehow make the creator of all into a created thing. They somehow flip the roles so much to assume that they are indeed the creators of a God who needs to be created. It's a fictitious installment of a false God with no real grip on who God truly is. And so what do they do is they reduce God and replace God Almighty with some impotent idol who never has the power to do anything. This has the power for nothing of good. And so they create this false God and it ultimately becomes, even though they're on their honeymoon, it becomes violation of rule number one. You shall have no other gods before me. This golden calf, it actually becomes a symbol, a picture. We've been looking at these symbols throughout the narrative of Exodus in the Bible. The golden calf becomes yet another symbol that we find in Exodus, and it becomes a clear picture of this repeated pattern of where Israel, God's chosen people, his beloved, would consistently reduce God, replace God, to put something else in the place that only God deserves. This becomes the repeated pattern, and we see this time and time again. In fact, the psalmist looks back on this moment, same one that we're reading here, and he begins to say, here's what they did back there in Exodus. They made a calf. They worshipped it. And my friend, this is, this is where we're at. This is the tension of it. They exchange the glory of God for the image of an ox that only eats grass. The psalmist looks back on this moment and he begins to help us to see that this is indeed a repeated pattern, that their affection and devotion that belonged to a heavenly father had long been forgotten. And in a very real sense, spiritual adultery had been committed. They had moved the alignment of their heart and put something else in its place and adultery becomes idolatry. The spiritual adultery that they've committed and now they've replaced God. And as I'm looking this, it's really, it's really difficult. It's difficult for me to look into a text like this and say, how could you, how could they, as I see God's hand so prevalent and so powerful in your life, and yet to come to a place of denying God, replacing them, and they literally said, these things will become our gods and now will go before us. How does that happen how did Israel let this go? How does it happen not to just Israel? How does it happen in my heart? How does it happen in your heart? How can you go from experiencing the goodness of God the favor of God, the blessing of God, seeing the hand of God, knowing the truth and the word of God, but bringing ourselves into a position where we reduce him, we create something in his place. How do we do the same thing that the Israelites did? It's easy to call them out until I start looking in the mirror of my own heart. Our deepest desires often distract our devotion. This becomes the path. There's something that's lodged in there. There's this expectation, this desire, this thing that needs to get fulfilled within me. And now I'm in search of something else that can fill it. God didn't do it the way that I thought he would do it. I'm not sure that he ever could do it in the way that I need it done. And therefore, I'm going to put something else in the place of my heavenly creator. I'm going to create something in the place that only God can meet that I believe will bring the fulfillment that my heart desires. And those desires often become a distraction that deters my devotion. 
I tried to put as much alliteration in here as possible. <laughs> Here's what I want to do with this. Look, I find myself in this text. We all find ourselves in this text. What do we do with it? What do we do when we begin to see and identify idols inside of ourselves? Here's what I want to do. I want to lead us through an exercise over a couple of minutes in identifying idols in our hearts. And just so we're on the same page, just so you understand, I want to kind of connect some dots for you. So identifying idols, an idol is any object or devotion that takes the place of God in a person's heart. No, see, an idol is like adultery, but it's much worse. And sometimes the problem with it is, well, let's start with the good news. Chances are I know my audience well enough that none of you have a golden cow at your house that you bow down to and pray to. I realize that some people in the world do that, but probably not you. So you could check that one off of your list. Way to go. <laughs> but sometimes it's hard to identify idols. Sometimes it's hard to see them for what they are because of what they mean to us and we become blinded to it. Sometimes it's hard to identify idols. And so I want to walk us through an exercise together of what that looks like. It may not be as obvious as a golden cow. So let me give you some examples. This is not exhaustive. I can't fit them all up here. You don't want to be here until tomorrow, right? So let me show you what this looks like. Just some examples as we are identifying idols. So let's start here at the top. Sometimes we can let our aspirations to be better, to become more, depending on how you define success, to accumulate more. Sometimes what happens for us is this becomes the most important factor in our hearts. It determines our decisions. It determines how we spend our time, our money, our resources, our energy, our efforts. Something happens when we would make these things the most important thing. In fact, idols can become idol. And we know this because Jesus actually says to us that you can't love both God and money, that you're going to have to choose one of these two, that you cannot serve both God and money. Right? So there's this idea even Jesus would present to us that when there is an idol between these two things, I'm going to have to make a decision about them. Sometimes the desire for power, I'm going to throw control in this category too. Sometimes that ability, that desire, that idea that I need to be the one who holds the power, who sits in the seat of control, therefore I'm not going to put a God in that spot. I'll be my own God. Sometimes, sometimes this pursuit of success or money or power, sometimes it's material possessions, sometimes, and oh my friend, this one gets sticky sometimes. Oh, sometimes it's relationships. I want you to think about this for a second. Do you remember Father Abraham had many sons? Who was one of his sons in which this very principle became the test of where his heart would be? It had to do with relationships. Abraham, father of our faith, when God decides, do you love me more than all other things? Is my devotion for you? He tests them in his closest relationships. There's something about our relationships that are around us. And sometimes, sometimes, I'm just being real with you. I'm going to talk to single folks for just a second. Sometimes we idolize the idea of being in a relationship that we are not content with being alone in ourselves. Sometimes that relationship, that marriage, that other person Students, you should hear this one. Sometimes that thing that we're in pursuit of, we elevate it so high that we actually put our need and our desire for companionship and community and relationship with others above the relationship with God. And the devastating thing is that when we get those things out of order, the very thing that we desire falls to destruction. When you change your relationships and you miss this one and you somehow put God up above the things in your life that are significant, but not the most important. And I'm going to mess with you because the next one messes with me. When we as parents begin to view the success of our children as the most important things that we aim our lives out, you are in danger. 
dangerous territory. When you begin to say what my children are involved in, their programs, their extracurriculars, when it's more important for me to be involved in Little League, come on, I'm going to just be honest. I grew up as a Little League, like baseball all the way through, college ball. We didn't grow up in a Christian household. If I were looking back and labeling it this way, my sports would have been major idols in my heart and took priority over any time that I would spend in word, relationship with God. We did not go to church because I traveled baseball around the country on the weekends. Sometimes you elevate things that are even good, they're important to you, and you put them way up here you don't like me calling it out, but measure your time, your resources, your energy, and where is the affection and devotion of your heart directed? This becomes what happens through our kids, sometimes through hobbies and interests. Now, just take my marriage. Forget an eternal covenant relationship with God. If I were to start to put any of these things as higher priority than my wife, do you know what kind of conversations it would lead to? Hey, we need to check this. In any healthy relationship, these things become issues. When I make something else more the point of my worship and devotion than what God has set himself up to be, I'm in dangerous territory. Something happens and we need to identify the idols that are in our lives, whether hobbies and interests. Sometimes it's things that are simple, like my entertainment. I need to be entertained. It's more important that I, you entertain me. I'm not going to filter what I'm entertained by because that's my prerogative, my choice. It's more important than what God's word says to me. And so we let things in our lives. This is reflection of what it looks like when your heart has begun to drift and your devotion is being distracted and you're putting something else in the place that only God belongs Something happens, and probably the one, just being honest, probably the one that, that gets me, maybe the one that gets you. Look, when you put your rationale, your way, your opinion, your better plan than God's, when you put your emotions, how you feel, how you think about something. When you put that and elevate self up above who God is supposed to be and what God says that he is, we have moved out of alignment and we are experiencing idolatry in our hearts. It's not always a golden cow, my friend. We have so many substitutes for what only God can provide. And so as we look at this, here's just some examples. Maybe it's sin. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe you want to love the Lord your God, but you are too involved with the pills that you pop or the joints that you smoke, and you cannot elevate God to the position that he needs to be in because you have another idol that controls you in your life. This is what happens. It's not necessarily golden cows, but it goes from success to my comforts, to my power, even the need for approval from others. These things get elevated to places they do not deserve. Martin Luther, the old theologian and preacher, would say it this way when he quoted, whatever your heart clings to, whatever you are gripped to, whatever you hold to tightest, it is this thing that has become your God. Wherever you put your trust, wherever you put your faith, whatever you confide in, that thing, that is your God. It would go on as I think about this idea of how do we have idols in our heart when I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I love Jesus, I know what the word says, how do I get to that place? Here's the problem sometimes, is good gifts go bad. Let me say it this way. When we elevate a good thing to the level of a God thing, it becomes a bad thing. When you take something that was a good gift from your heavenly father, even including your marriage, your children, your financial blessings, your education, whenever you elevate this good thing to the place of a God thing, it is now a bad thing. 
This, my friends, is the path of idolatry for most people. You're not setting out a golden calf and bowing down to it, but what you are doing is taking good things and putting them in the position of God's things. And that is a bad thing to do. This becomes the problem. So I want to help you to see something here. Because maybe you think this is just an Old Testament ideal. I want to help to shape what I'm going to call your idolology, your study of idolatry. I want to help you to understand something for just a minute. Inside of our idolatry, inside of our ideology, what you need to know is your human heart and my human heart, it's an idol factory. My mind and my imagination, my heart, it constantly looks to replace God and to recreate him as something that I can control him to be. This is what your heart looks to do, is to create and generate images and reflections of a God that best suits your narrative. <sighs> it's a factory. And my heart generates them. And so does yours. The human heart is indeed an idol factory. And so there are times when we're tempted to trust in things that cannot and will not provide the security that we put ourselves and our hope and our trust into. So here's what you need to know in your idolology. Only idols promise what only God can provide. Now, you've been alive long enough that while you may not have said it this way, in my words, you would have different words for it. It's the in search of stage and place of life. It's when the heart goes wandering, when it goes looking because it's longing. There's something within that needs to be fulfilled. It's a desire. And yet, we look for every other thing to provide what only God can provide. It will make promises to us, whether comfort or security or success or power or purple, purple, purpose. <laughs> Idols are idle, but purple, apparently. <laughs> Idols are I-D-L-E. They don't move. They don't lead you anywhere. They can't do anything. They can promise, but they can't provide. Idols are idle. Idols are impotent. They're powerless to do anything for you. They will ultimately end up in being in places of disappointment. Why? Because only God can provide what he promises. We find that idols are not just promises that only God can provide, but idols also demand what only God deserves. It begins to put expectations on top of us. By demanding our devotion, our idols steal the love that is supposed to be reserved for only a loving covenant relationship between my heart and the heart of my heavenly father. This is what it looks like, but my idols begin to demand something of me. My attention, my affection, my devotion. They will call my mind. They will drift my heart. What happens is it speaks to me and demands something of my heart that only God deserves. And then when it makes its demands, one of the demands that gets the loudest is idols require sacrifice. Idols are dangerous and destructive because they require you to sacrifice. Even though in your heart you have this longing, this desire that God himself has put there. Even though you have searched everywhere else for fulfillment. What happens is that when you let idols begin to make dem demands of your heart, your attention, your affection, and your demotion, your devotion. Then what happens is they begin to require sacrifice of you. What are you sacrificing well, anytime you get relationships out of order with your heavenly father, you are sacrificing the closest relationships around you. And 
you are also sacrificing the actual potential to find fulfillment and purpose from a heavenly father. As long as you are in pursuit of all of these other things and they sit as top priority in your heart, then you will come up short and continue to sacrifice the blessing, the peace, the security that only a heavenly father can give you, the purpose, the calling that he has written over you. You would sacrifice all of those things for some golden God who only eats grass. Hmm. They require something of us. It's dangerous. It's destructive. So here's what we see. Here's what I want you to know. Here's the basic idea that I want you to take away from this is that idols always fail. Every time. When you put your hope and your faith and your trust in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ and your relationship with your heavenly father, idols will fail you. God never does. Idols will fail, but God will fulfill. That longing, those desires, the thing that you look to be satisfied, only God meets us there. And so the call the action, what do I do with this as I contemplate what's within my own heart, is to embrace wholehearted devotion. God invites us into covenant relationship where we would forsake all other individuals and embrace wholehearted devotion. There's no room in my heart for other gods according to God. So what do we do? Let me give you some really practical things in a spiritual topic. Let me just show you here how we overcome idols together. And we'll start here at the top. Is The first one is that we have to identify idols. This means that you're actually in a position humble enough to look into your heart to say, God, I don't really want things to be out of priority. I don't want to have idols in my heart. I definitely want what you have for me. I don't want to sacrifice all of that. It requires something of you. It requires that you're going to start in this place where doing some soul searching, some heart searching, even in areas that you don't really want to open up to the Lord. Things that you would just as soon keep closed off. Relationships that you wish he wouldn't tap into. Addictions that you wish he wouldn't touch. Secrets that you thought were only yours. Sometimes those things have become the very idols of our heart. And we have to identify them, label them, call them out. Look, you might look like a blessing. You might look like security. You might look like safety. I'm going to call you out and put a different label on you today. You, you ain't nothing but an idol in my life. I'm going to see it for that. I'm going to recognize it as that. And then I'm going to do something else with it because it's not enough to just label something. I've actually got to remove it. I got to get rid of it. It can't stay there doesn't belong there. It's out of order. Something has to change. Something has to give. There's a few verbs that are all throughout scripture that kind of give us a verb on what we should do. I'm going to give you a couple of them, but there's a whole bunch of them. I'll tell you which one mine is. So here, here's a couple of them right here. So assuming that you have idols in your life, this was Ezekiel. This was a prevalent in Israel's culture. So even outside of Exodus in Ezekiel, it says, I said to them, cast away. Send off, separate from, don't let it be here any longer. Put it in a box and send it over there. Cast away these detestable things. Anything we put above God in our lives is detestable in the eyes of the Lord. It's detestable, these things that you feast on, every one of you. And here's what idols do to us. They defile, they corrupt our very hearts within you. These idols of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. And so we get one instruction for us that if there are idols in the heart, we need to remove them. How do we remove them? Maybe you need to choose some verbiage. Let them set sail. Cast them away. There's another verb that I like, and it comes from this picture also of relationship and covenant, and it's from 1 Corinthians. It says to us, therefore, my beloved, my treasured possession, my chosen one, the one that I love, you, you are my beloved. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry, run away from, set your life in a different direction as fast as you can go, get away from 
flee. Flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. This becomes the call of God for our hearts and our lives. We need to remove these idols. But this is where I want to get up close. The removal of idols is a potentially painful process. Let me show you. The removal of idols is a potentially painful process because what does it mean for us? What does it require for us? If something has become an idol, we've said that it is an object of your affection and devotion, something that you have put your trust and hope in. If we start challenging things that you love and adore and put your hope and your trust in, your immediate response to this, <clears throat> this is the heart's response because I cling to the thing that I established. I created it. I love it. It is my idol. I have it sitting here in its place. And something happens sometimes as we have to remove idols. It means facing fears and doubts and even vulnerabilities within us. This is not as easy as just say it out loud. This is something that has hooks in your heart. It is the object of your affection and devotion. You love it. You trust it. And so when God says for you to begin letting go of attachments, <laughs> no thanks. When God begins to say, I need you to transition your trust even from that relationship and put it back into relationship with me, Sometimes it's a painful process. Sometimes it means a redirection of my affection. Sometimes they were good things gone bad. I mean, I gotta reprioritize. I gotta make some adjustments. I gotta change my calendar. I gotta change what my kids do and where we are. These become things when they become idols of the heart. Sometimes it means it's painful because, well, it's an idol of my heart, but it's something that not everybody knows about. And maybe I got to confess it and talk about it. Maybe it's a thing where I need some places of accountability. So for us, how do we overcome idols? We have to identify them. We have to remove them. Even though it might become painful parts of your heart, having the courage, the boldness, the heart to say, God, you first. So how do we do this? The third part of this is to embrace wholehearted devotion. The call throughout the message is to recognize the longing within you and to embrace the idea that it is the very God who created you who put that desire in you. No matter how much you seek other things, you're going to be this place where only devotion to God turning away from distractions and returning to devotion of the heart. This becomes the only path for overcoming idols in our heart and our life is that we would cultivate deeper relationships with our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do that? We do that through applying his word to our hearts. We do that in relationship with each other like we're in here today. We cultivate deeper relationships as we put God back in his rightful place that God would be first. And I told you this is much like a love story. When I was in elementary school, we used to pass these notes back and forth. Maybe you remember them. We used to write a note that would say, I love you. And do you love me? Check the box. Yes or no. And then if you were me, you scratched out no, right? It just, you know, you get one option. But do you love me? I think about this idea as a heavenly father presents this to us that simply says this today that, you know, I, I choose you. Do you choose me back? I love you. I'm for you. Do you love me? I think this is the choice. I've listened to a lot of pastors and sermons on idolatry. And I just want to be honest with you. Most of the time it feels like judgment and condemnation. It feels like it's presented in this place of like, hey, if you don't this, then I'll smite you because I'm this smiter. Look, don't miss this. There is judgment. It does cause destruction. Idolatry is definitely sin. 
It's the first one on his list. But in all of this, it's going to destroy the heart of the relationship. And this is what God cares about. God cares for you so deeply that he chose you and invites you into a loving relationship with him. It's not based on your ability to keep it all together. It's based on where you direct your affection. Are you Lord of my heart? Do I love you with all of my mind, soul, and body? This becomes the question that Jesus would ask. When I think about my response to this answer is definitely like in that, do you love me? Do you love me? Yes or no? There's, I've already checked the yes box. Actually, I did that a long time ago. Many of you have checked the yes box. And this is where it's a, an interesting thing about God's character revealed. Because like I said, I expect judgment, condemnation. I've checked the box to said yes, and my heart looked a lot like Israel. Put something else in God's place, idolatry. And so it's hard for me sometimes because even I will self-condemn to say, yo, I said yes, but I did A, B, and C. I went outside of my marriage relationship with God and this covenant that we have, and, and guilt and condemnation would come to sit on me. I would expect God to be pretty ticked at me, to be honest with you. Thou shalt not. There's a beautiful story in the Old Testament because it's such a theme of adultery and idolatry that rolls through our scriptures. There's a beautiful story that really helps to communicate your father's heart for you. It was about two characters, Hosea and Gomer. And what would happen in here was that there was such a love that would continue to lead one in pursuit of the other, no matter how many times the other committed adultery, turned away from, went back to their old ways of doing things. And this becomes yet a symbol of the Heavenly Father's response to when I do the same. And that, my friends, is more powerful to me than thou shalt not or the judgment or condemnation that might come with it. I have fallen short and so have you. The invitation is not one of considering whether you have or have not, but yet to be reminded that when you do, there is a God who is not condemning you, but calling you. He is calling you back to covenant relationship with him. The thing that you keep trying to put as the priority of your heart is now being challenged. What are you putting in front of God in your life? What is the Holy Spirit in this moment singling out? What is it as we've been talking about this that you realize, you know what, sometimes this does creep up to a place that it doesn't belong. Today is the day to check that, to identify it, to label it, to call it out, to remove it. There's another place, and it's actually in our Exodus 32 account, where it wasn't just fleeing from, it wasn't just let it set sail, it was grinding and smashing of, smashing idols. I almost called it that, and then I thought of smashing pumpkins. And so, <laughs> There, there's something for me that has to happen. And maybe for you, it's to put it in a box with a cute little bow and set it sail down the river and let it go. For me, something has to happen with an idol begins to set itself up. It must be boom, boom. There must be a place in which there's smashing of idols of my heart because they don't belong there. And I know better and you know better. And when we begin to exalt something that way, it should be the first response of the heart to say, no, 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 boom, smashing of idols. So what is it for you that you need to destroy, to give back, to set sail? What idol has captivated your attention, your affection, and your devotion? Would you identify it? Will you remove it? Will you embrace wholehearted devotion? 
It may be a painful process. It may lead you to have to do some things after you leave here today. That's okay. Will you have the courage of heart? Will you be brave enough? Will you have faith enough to transfer trust back to the only God who can satisfy what's inside of you? I wish I could make the decision for you, but I cannot. And because a heavenly father loves you so much, he will not. It will be your choice. You choose. He chooses, I love you. Do you love me? If you will love me, you will obey me, and I'll be your priority. I want to pray for you today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you love us so deeply, that your devotion for us is unlimited. It is unrestricted. Thank you, God that you set in motion to call us your people, to choose us as your own, that we are your sons and your daughters. Lord, just being real, there are too many times in my own heart where it begins to resemble what was happening in Exodus, where even though they knew you, even though they had seen you, something begins to distract their devotion. God, I've been guilty of this so often, of seeing your presence, have experienced your purpose, and yet let something else take place over you. God, I'm going to do what your word calls us to do. That's to repent. Scripture tells us that if we have put anything above God in our hearts, that it is indeed sin and that it begins by identifying, removing, must be birth in repentance. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for making it about my own way. I'm sorry for becoming my own God. I'm sorry for reducing you. I'm sorry for replacing you. God, be the fullness of who you are in my life, not some fictitious, fake, false version that I have created for myself, but be Jehovah God. Help my friends today, God, who are navigating the tensions of their heart, who maybe have replaced you with relationships. Help them to have faith today. Help them to see Give them the courage. I want to speak to those of you who might be here and say, well, I've always done the idle thing. I've never put God first. There's always been somebody else there or something else there. And this is an opportunity for you as well, whether you're watching online or here in the room. God wants relationship with you. He's speaking to you today. The invitation is simply say, God, I want you to be first in my heart, be first in my life. I'm going to transfer my trust to you today. And in faith, God, I confess my sins to you and I accept Jesus as the payment for my sins. And by doing so, scripture tells us this act of faith actually puts God as first in our heart and brings us into relationship with him. This is where it begins. And those of you in the room who've been mature believers for a while, be challenged today to keep God as the priority of your heart. We all drift. You're all going to be tempted. You're all going to face these things at work, in the marketplace. Be reminded that idols fail. God fulfills. Embrace God's call for wholehearted devotion. In Jesus' name, amen.